Also wir sind immer noch bei Crytek beim Crisis 3 Community Day und haben jetzt hier äh, Mike Reed, er ist ähm, Producer und ähm, wird uns eine Weile zur Verfügung stehen, um ein paar Fragen zu beantworten in unserer Lotterie. Wir probieren nämlich mal was Neues aus. Ähm, wir machen es so, dass wir grüne Fragen und rote Fragen haben. Die grünen, das weiß er schon, sind nette Fragen. Die roten Fragen sind eher ein bisschen, äh, ein bisschen fies und ein bisschen investigativer. Ihr habt ja einige davon selbst auch äh, vorgeschlagen in dem, äh, eure Fragen an Crytek Thread. Und ähm, genau, wir schauen einfach mal, wie sich das entwickelt und ob das gut kommt mit der Lotterie. Hi, nice that you're hey, there. Nice to meet you. So, you can, you can uh, pick the questions okay. as you wish. I'll have to translate them because they're all... Them a little bit. Yeah. We'll go with, uh, I think we're gonna go with the green one here first. I have to translate them first. Uh -huh. Oh, you, oh you, you just took the best one first. Did I? Um, I don't know if it's, uh, if it's some kind of spoiler to, for the story, but the question is, who is Karl Ernst Rasch? Oh, who is Karl Ernst Rasch? Um, so, Karl Ernst Rasch, uh, as many people know, um, as part of the crisis story, um, what dates back to the, uh, the expedition that happened in Russia. And there's very little known about him and his involvement, but there's, there's a lot of mystery surrounding him and, and what exactly has happened to him. Um, he might have something to do in Crisis 3, he may not have something to do in Crisis 3, he may be elemented in there there may be some hints i mean there's there's a lot of things that i think that people are going to hear and see in the story in general yes, of course that yeah. a lot of questions answered i mean we're we're coming to the end of the trilogy yeah. and people have still have a lot of questions and i don't i i don't think this is going to answer everything for everybody but i think that that um there's going to be a lot of big things that uh, that will come out in uh, in crisis three but will you keep it as a trilogy Uh, so when we talk about when we talk about crisis as a trilogy, we talk about um, this part of the story. And yeah. you know, crisis was always intended to be a trilogy. We yeah. managed to get that far and do very well with the game. So it's uh, it's it's pretty cool for us to come back and and really just close out the story. So in closing out this part of the story, we can look yeah. back on crisis and go, okay, where are we? And you know, what other kinds of what kinds of things can we can we take this further? I think in terms of the crisis universe, there's a lot of different directions and a lot. Of different ways yeah. that we can go in the future yeah yeah of course you can pick another one if you want to I can all right uh, you, can, you can take a red one or another green one let's go with the red let's 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 see how let's see how okay, don't judge me for what's in there I, I won't I'll try not to uh, okay this is a quite uh, uh, quite new one um, Just uh, recently, um, uh, THQ went insolvent, mm -hmm. and um, Crytek has uh, bought the uh, Homefront uh, IP. Um, yeah, maybe you can answer the question before. Um, I, I yeah, I, 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 I know about that. Um, you know, I mean that that's basically been in the headlines. There's not really a whole lot I can say around that. Yeah. But you know, we did we did come back. I mean, it's it's been known for quite some time that we've been working on Homefront 2, yeah, Our, our yeah. UK studio has. Um, and uh, you know, recently THQ um, closed shop and auctioned off all of their their assets. So uh, one of the things we did was uh, we picked up Homefront 2. There's not really much more detail I can go into that. That's really of up course. to our, our business departments and and, and uh, you know when that when that whole thing is done and we can we can take announcements further as to you know what we're gonna what we're gonna do with it and where we're gonna go. So the players have to wait for that. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a waiting question. I'm gonna go with another red one, just just okay. for that, because I, okay. you know, that you that one's one. uh, that one's uh, that one's a little bit bit of a tight question right now. Ah. It's pretty hot off the presses. Okay. Um, okay, this isn't. Uh, yeah. Okay. It's a uh, war and uh, violence are very very um, great topics in the video game industry. Mm -hmm. um, how does Crisis 3 um, handle that? Um, so I mean. It, Video games as a whole, I mean, have, you know, over the years been, you know, pr progressively getting a little bit more violent in, in some yeah. ways. I mean, yeah. but when we even go back, I mean, we, we go back to games like Doom, for instance, and even even before that with, with the birth of first-person shooters with Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, they've they've been around for for quite some time. But when we go back even further in history and we look at things like rock and roll, for instance, when people used to go, oh, that yeah. stuff, yeah. you know, it's 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 demonizing our children. It's doing all these things. So, um, you know, there's there's always this kind of media that's going to be pointed to along along the ways. 
Um, you know, there's, I mean, this isn't really an easy topic to, to get into discussions on, and, of course, you know, yeah. where it's at. I mean, especially with all the events that are that are happening in the U.S. and, um, you know, between the NRA and talking to the games industry and, and all of these things that are that are combined. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's it's. I mean, when you look at, I mean, Germany, especially with the USK rating system, I mean, they're they're very, they're one of the most strict. Yeah, I uh, think that we even have to censor the game that you just. I mean, <laughs> just just they, the they are they are very strict. I mean, Australia is another one which you know has pretty hefty yeah. restrictions on that. Um, but they've actually recently added a uh, a new rating that's been that's been yeah. added in for Australia to allow for some of these games to come into market. Yeah. Not that Germany has done that, but when you go and look at. Um, I, I think that you know Germany has a very strict system when it comes to this. I mean, you go to Gamescom, for instance, and you have to box in your boots when you don't have yeah. a rating and you're potentially rated on these systems. I don't really have a problem with that, and it's it's taken like looking at compare and contrast and things like that. I mean, you know, some people will turn around and go, "Oh, it's like buying cigarettes at the store," and you know, it's really up to a number of things. I mean, at the parental level to make sure their children are you know um, watching and playing content that. Yeah. Uh, that uh, you know they want their children they want their children to be seeing. I mean that's really up to the parental level, and then of course you have at the at the store and the purchase level to to restrict that as well. When something's rated and those are the laws in the country, then they should be adhering to those. Yeah. Um, you know it, it's it's a it's a big topic of debate whether you know I mean what this does to the psyche of people when they're playing violent video games and do they automatically course, yeah. run out and go I want to shoot a gun or I want to kill somebody yeah. I want to do these things. I think that there's, you know, it's it, it's it, it, to pinpoint it on one thing as a whole. I think is is really the wrong way to go about it. But look at yeah. it as a global picture. I mean, whether you're pointing at guns or you're pointing at video games or you're pointing at music, movies, TV, all of these things combined, and then mixed in with the media that sensationalizes a lot of these events. I think that you know, it's uh, po pointing at one thing is definitely the wrong yeah. way to way to go about it. In crisis, yeah. I mean, if you look at crisis. It's not a very, very violent I mean, game. you go in, I mean, we're, we don't have exploding heads, you can't take people's yeah. limbs off, you can't do all of these, you can't do all of these crazy things. Yeah, that's and, one of the... And, I mean, is it necessary? Is it necessary to go that far? I mean, really, that depend, that's more of a creative decision. And, I mean, some games want to go that far, and, and, I mean, is it sometimes people jump into a game and they look at it and they go, wow, that's cool, but it's cool for, like, five minutes, and then you're like, okay, well, you know, I think I've seen enough heads explode. I mean, you look at Borderlands, for instance, you know, having heads exploding in the first one, and then in the second one they came in and they, they did that as well. I don't know the exact reasoning behind it. I don't know if it was rating board or if they just decided, you know, this is completely unnecessary. Why should we do it? Um, but, I mean, I think there's an overall tone in the industry. I mean, first-person shooter games, they're, they're, they've are they're they been popular for, you know, the better part of 20 years now. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's going to go away. I think you're going to see, you know, an evolution in, in many cases of that. And, you know, I mean, it's... It, it's Games are still very much an art form. As some people don't want to look at games as an art form, I mean, it's there's no other industry out there that really takes you know artists and programmers and artists and programmers and audio folks and and animators and all of these things and throws them all into one and goes, you got to make something really cool. You don't yeah. see that in really yeah. in any. I mean, you see similar things in movies, but when you have that whole interactive element tied into that, it it really changes things a lot. Yeah. But actually, I was just a, a little surprised that uh, that Crisis Three uh, didn't get Get more violent than Crisis 2. Um, I was happy about that because mm -hmm. I, I totally, totally agree with you that um, that uh, violence is not uh, is not always necessary. It's a creative decision. Mm -hmm. I, I think so too. And um, but I, I, in, in some kind, I uh, expected because of the uh, expected the uh, the development to go in a more violent way. But in in, no. in case of the bow in Crisis 3, maybe it gets just a little less violent even. Um, um, yeah, maybe. yeah, possibly. I mean, I. <laughs> I don't know if that's the way I'd put it. I mean, especially when you have the different arrow tips and all the different things yeah, you can yeah. do with them um, to, to do this in, in very creative ways. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we've taken it, you know, any any step further in terms of, you know, going, yeah, we need more blood, we need more gore, yeah. we need more limbs yeah. exploding, those kinds of things to, to put it in there. But, uh, you know, I mean, it's, it, it's I, I've always grown up with the whole thing of, you know, watching movies and going, you know, that's not real, this isn't what real is, yeah. is. this is, you know, a fantasy kind of thing, and, and that's how it should be treated. 
Um, of course. And you know the same thing. The same thing goes for video games now. You know, again, you know, some children and, and parents and what they want to present to their children and that and that fact in that aspect is uh, you know really up to them to educate themselves on what these games are, what they're all about, and uh, and you know whether they want their children playing them or not. Okay, enough violence for today. Yes. Let's take another question. Let's go with, uh, what do we do? We did a second red one. That, that was actually, that's a really good question. And, you know, it's a really, it's a really, uh, it's a really heated topic right now that I've, uh, I've been reading a lot on. Yeah, that's because it's just ended up in a lottery. But this is one about, uh, actually about Crisis 3 and mm -hmm. about the new features. Yes. Because with the Hunter mode, you, um, uh, you, you came into, with, you came into, uh, Oh, well, I don't know how to translate it exactly, but with the Hunter mode, the Hunter mode is a very innovative and, mm -hmm. and kind of new um, a multiplayer thing. Um, what was the inspiration? Um, that's really more of a question for the designers specifically on that one. Um, from from what I do know in, in talking to Adam Duckett, the lead game designer, is it's something that they had been toying around with for quite some time. Yeah. And, you know, they, they finally got a chance to bring this in as a new mode into, into Crisis. And it was... It was, a, I think it was a little nerve wracking for him because I was there at some of the early test stages before we went out <laughs> to Gamescom. And yeah, what yeah. you find is, is we had a, we had a group of experts come in, they sat down at the, at the, at the desks and they were playing the game and they were quiet. They were all quiet. And Adam's like, I don't think they like it. I don't think they <laughs> like it. And I was like, I don't think that's it. And it's like when you're watching somebody playing it versus when you're actually sitting and playing it yeah. and the tension that's involved in it, like people are very silent. And, but when it comes to the end, yeah, very silent and very concentrated. But when it comes to the end of the round, people become very animated about it. But what we found is after we pulled these guys out, we had them play some rounds, we pulled them into a room and they said, hey guys, what do you think of this? And they were like, oh, it's great. We love this. Yeah. We love this. We don't like this. So it, it was... It was a uh, it was a group that EA has called the Experts Club, which is a which is a group of gamers from various backgrounds, from you know yeah. PC to Xbox, PS3, and all of these different things that we bring in to actually play the game and have them you know give us some qualitative feedback on that. Um, so it it evolved out of that. I mean, I think it was something. It's it's kind of a hybrid between a lot of different modes that have you know been tried. I mean, Adam gets upset with me when I talk about it. Is I, I've mentioned it before. You know, it's it's kind of like it, it, we don't like to refer to it as that, but kind of like a zombie mode where you know it's or or an in, in infected uh, or an infected kind of mode. Um, you know, there is elements of that, but not really. But yeah. having that having that whole element of you know, I mean, it, sometimes you come into it like we saw the games that we played today, where people are like, oh, the hunters are really overpowered. But if you get two guys starting out with it, hunters that are not good with the bow, I mean, it yeah. will kind of balance yeah. it more towards the cell. Like the games we played the other day. With some with another group, I mean, we saw various various elements. Sometimes the hunters would be winning and going through, and occasionally the cell would get through. But when it comes down to being that last guy, is really the kind of tension that we wanted to go for and, and try to emulate and have people uh, jump on that. Yeah, I experienced it as a as a very very special multiplayer uh, mode. Maybe maybe one of the most special I've ever seen because of the combination of the, mm -hmm. of, the of the team play and of the of the one on one. Um, yeah, uh, shooting shooting experience because you you, you you switch teams while you're playing the round. Yeah. that's kind of weird. Uh, you just have to get used to it, and and then I think it's very um, it's very special, and very it, intense. It does take a little bit of getting used to when you first yeah. start out with it, and I mean we can we we've done videos on it and we've tried to explain it. But until you sit down and you start playing it, it's it's a little daunting to try to figure out what what exactly is happening here because I'm on one side, then I'm on the other, yeah. and also with any kind of asymmetrical gameplay mode, um, yes. it, it's always a, it's always a tough thing to try to like where's the balance in this. I mean, you can't have if you noticed on Hunter versus versus Crash Site, for instance, you have um, a lot more customizable options in Crash Site, of course, yeah. because you know you have that extra element of nano suit versus nano suit, and but in an asymmetrical mode, we have to limit the number of options that players have and in, in what they can and can't do.
red one, just okay. for fun. Okay, another red one. Um, you're working on the third game of the Crisis IP. Mm -hmm. um, aren't you scared of, of uh, repeating yourself or just iterate over and over again and bore the players? Well, it, I mean, so there's a lot of trilogies out there these days. I mean, you've got Dead Space 3, you've got Far Cry 3, yeah. you've got Crisis 3. Um, and you know, I, I think when I look when I look at at those other titles and and sort of where they've come from, I, I think the one thing that Crisis really has in its trilogy is a consistent story, yeah. all the way through. Um, you know, I mean, all of these uh, putting together a game in conjunction with a story, in conjunction with like how does this all tie in, always ends up with some kind of holes in it, um, which can either be filled in at a later date or we have actually filled in but we don't want to tell people because it yeah. may be something something that we want to use in the future um, but I think in terms I think in terms of crisis and when when I look at one and two and coming back to three that you know I mean three three is really ending it pretty strong we didn't want to go and break down the crisis franchise at that point and go well you know let's let's build an RTS game where a nano suit is in a circus and he's got elephants and stuff and then people are yeah. like well, what's going on here this doesn't make any sense so you know it was really maintaining maintaining the brand maintaining the IP and then coming out and really kind of Closing out this part of the story is what we wanted to do, and I mean, that's the one thing we can say indefinitely. If you go back and look at the quotes from 2007 from Shavat, he w yeah. he says flat out, "This is a trilogy," and we, you know, achieve that. We achieve that with the, yeah. with the Crisis franchise. We didn't have to stop at two. We went to three, and we wanted to finish that off. Um, but I think in a, in a lot of ways, this one's definitely the strongest in the series. I mean, we didn't make a lot of over the top and wacky changes and going, yeah, you need to have 20 nano suit modes on here, so you know, you need to, you don't <laughs> yeah, need no. you don't need just one controller now, you need two controllers to do this. We didn't want to go we didn't want to go in and do anything crazy. So, we really wanted to maintain that and I think we've done a pretty good job of that and not not only fin in in finishing out the story as well, but also iterating a little bit more on the on the multiplayer aspects too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we can take another one if you okay. like. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. Let's go green. Maybe there's a mean one hidden here too. Oh, maybe. Oh, no, it's like that. Um, well, that's quite the opposite of mean. Um, what are the um, the the new features and the and the the developments in Crisis Three that you are mostly proud of? The new features and developments in Crisis Three that we're mostly proud of. Um, the one that really comes to mind to me that is almost not apparent while you're building the game and and you know people are probably going to attribute me to saying this is the graphics but it was yeah. really going back and taking the first environment and the second environment and combining those and i don't think people kind of realize what a big challenge that was for not only our level designers but you know the art guys that are feeding into that as well um and then of course the game designers that are like that have to play into this so all of yeah. these things need to combine but in that from the visual styles and you guys have seen i mean you got to play swamps firsthand today yeah. um i don't know if you got to play any of the previous demos that we put out with canyon or yeah. I'm, i'm sure you've seen them though yeah, um that. but looking at those and how distinctly different both of those environments are in terms of the way the buildings are structured, in terms of the way the vegetation is placed and how much water is there and what the lighting is. Um, you know, it's not like having New York City built and then going, okay, this is daytime, this is nighttime and having all these real references, but we had to go and take a lot of these elements and, and do paint overs and go, what would New York City like it be like if there was a dome put over, it's hot, it's sweaty, it's gross, yeah. it has vegetation growing up through it. Um, you know, what it would it look and what would it feel like? Uh, so we went, that, that was really one of the big things. Um, I, I think that, you know, we really, we really did spend a lot of time on and, and achieve yeah. that. And that also ends up tending to complement into the game itself. A lot of people have said, well, you know, can you use the environment? Is the environment destructible? Is, you know, can you blow things up? Can you kick things? Can you throw them around? And absolutely, you can, yes, you can do that. You can't do it with everything for, for obvious reason. There are limitations to it, but there is, we did bring back a lot of that Destructibility, which also allows our game designers to to look at this and go, okay, how can we use this? And our level designers, of course, how can we use this to complement yeah. the the gameplay yeah. itself? Um, 
so I think that those really are the are the two things that that we've we've looked at and really spent a lot of time on to try to help the environments complement how the game plays out in itself while still being generally familiar. While I was playing the the demo uh, this afternoon, I, I really um, really appreciated that the the levels are um, are very very more more open and very more there's there's a lot of space there are a lot of routes that you can go very. Um, or there, there are a lot of more, there are a lot more decisions than in, in Crisis Two. I think, what, what route you pick and how you proceed. Yeah, there, there definitely is. I mean, it's basically you get a marker on the map and you're like, you got to get there. But it's like, how do you get there? And I mean, there's a yeah, number yeah. of ways, especially that first marker in the in the first area that you play through, where you can either go up the stairs or there's ways you can climb up and grab. You have that vertical motion, but I mean, every time you go, okay, well, you know, I'm going to start this and then I'm going to go left. Okay, well, left didn't really work too well. Let's try going right. And then yeah. you get that different experience when you go through and even going up and down some of these different things. And depending on how you react it also will affect how the AI will react and where they move around because you'd be like oh there's an AI around that corner and he's going to be waiting for me and then you go around that corner and you're like oh he's not there <laughs> so it's it's that kind of it's those kind of little dynamic things that we've added in i mean AI is AI is is of course a big one that's that's tied into that as well which has helped us uh, you know not only the way that they call i'm sure you've heard that the way they call back and forth to each other uh, the way they call back and forth to each other as well and um, and uh, you know, we've done a number of. There's a number of. The the thing that people don't see on the front end of that is really the work that's been done on the Cry Engine, which you saw a yeah. little bit of a demo of before. That's really yeah. helped our level designers spend more time actually making cool things and cool objects and and you know cool game uh, cool game designs than going, oh well, okay, I gotta make this guy do this, and he can only go. Here can only go here and you can only go here but having you know the cry engine systems do the brunt of, of that work for you and I was happy to, to see that uh, as far as I can tell there is a lot more there's a lot more more collectible data in the levels so that, uh, that yeah yeah, yeah so that was a Stephen so Stephen Hall uh, who um, you know came in after uh, Richard Morgan to write for crisis I mean he's yeah. been he's been absolutely awesome to work with um, you know, Richard. Richard really brought in for Crisis Two a bigger focus on the more of the tech porn side of of what the Crisis universe is about. And Stephen comes comes in and really brings great character development. I mean, yeah. you experience some of this in the demo that in the demo that you played in the in the in the uh, back and forth between Psycho and a uh, Psycho and Prophet and Claire and and and, and the things that go on yeah. in between that. So, but it's a, it's a lot. I mean, I find the story in general that, you know, people had been asking. I I talked to a number of people about this when they said, "Well, you know, I couldn't really I liked Crisis 2, but I couldn't really follow the story. I didn't get yeah. it." And people I was I would ask them I go what is it you want out of the story what is it you're looking for and yeah. the majority of the answers I would get from people is they want more character development they yeah, want yeah. more interactions between the characters mm -hmm. it was like it was kind of there in crisis one but it wasn't because you were I mean there was a percentage where you were either with people or you were alone and the and when you were alone <laughs> was a bigger portion of that and I mean the same sort of thing is kind of in crisis 3 but except the moments where you have those direct interactions are a lot bigger than yeah. Uh, than what you experienced in both Crisis One and Crisis Two combined. Yeah, uh, that's uh, that's exactly uh, the same thing that I uh, that I experienced and uh, that I that I think about the, the demo that we that we just recently played um, because I, I that, that's the, the first time in, in Crisis the scene that we that we've seen we don't want to talk about. No, we, we can't. Well, anything. we can't talk about that. You guys got anything. to see a good chunk. Yeah, but um, but I could I could really relate to the characters mm -hmm. because they're. they're it's, it's, a ver it's very intense and very emotional. And, but there's uh, a very human element to it, and I think that's really yeah. the key thing that we're we yeah. were trying we were trying to come back to. And there's there's a there's a struggle that happens throughout the game yeah. Um, yeah. on that front. And we've actually shown a little bit of that a little bit of that from from some of the field stuff and, and the interactions that happened between between Prophet and uh, and Psycho coming back too. And I think yeah. some people there was also another thing people people were a little. Um, some people were a little disappointed that we brought Psycho back and it wasn't the same actor and you know why did we replace him and, and, and a lot of those things. Um, th there was a there was a number of reasons you know f there was a number of reasons for that. Um, you know we just felt the the new character actually fit 
uh, mm -hmm. fit the role a little bit better and what we were trying to achieve and, and especially fleshing out his background and you know what's happened over that time and also in terms of uh, performance capture as well. Mm -hmm. But as far as I can see, I'm really excited about uh, how the story will proceed. Mm -hmm. So we can take another one if you want, if you like. Yeah, we'll do one more. I'm, I'm a little. I, I, I like these green ones, but you okay. know, it's. Uh, I, I want to give you guys a little more content, and you know, they've. They're actually all really good questions. Um, okay. Except for the one that I refused to answer. <laughs> oh well. I think that's that's a boring one. I yeah. think we nearly answered that one uh, mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, Crisis Three is uh, uh, Crisis Three has not been released yet, but there are already rumors about the future of the of the series. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of development would you wish for? Yeah, I mean, I can give my personal standpoint of what I would wish for, but that's not necessarily that's what the gamers yeah. are. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of things that as a group we've talked about. Um, you know, even leading up as Crisis Three was in development. I mean, one thing that I've had a lot of pe things from people is co-op. <laughs> Everybody's yeah. like, "Oh my God, co-op would be so awesome with this, with two guys in nano suits and all these, all these cool things we can add in." Um, that would definitely be it. Um, from my personal side, and I'm going to leave this on my personal side, course, is yeah. um, I, I, I'm a gamer who really loves um, team-based. Uh, FPS games. I play, you know, I've played Team Fortress 2 for many years, both on both in competitive and in uh, in in casual. I played more casual than anything. Um, uh, you know, there's there's countless games over the years with with Planet Side and Planet Side 2 and and uh, Tribes, for instance, and a game called Allegiance, which Microsoft put out, and of course Natural Selection and Natural Selection 2, which has come out recently as well. Nice. Um, I'm big fans of those kinds of team games and, and really more tighter team elements where one guy can't go in and run around and completely dominate the map over and over and over again. Um, those I'd love to see that done properly with nano suits, and I know that people have brought up, um, you know, Power Struggle, for instance, which you know was a pretty heavy team-based uh, mode from from the original Crisis that people liked. Um, we'd have to go back and really spend a lot of time doing that. I know people had their hopes up that you know we possibly might actually do this for Crisis Three, um, and actually we unfortunately didn't get around to uh, to make having that make it in. Um, at least for this, yeah, but I think yeah. there's I think there's a lot of opportunities in that. I mean, I've I've said before. I mean, we're we're at a very early stage in talking about what could be the possible next thing we're gonna yeah. move in we're gonna move into. Um, you know, it, it it could be anything at this point. But as I as I've as I've said previously in the press, I mean, it's it's really up to the designers. And now that we're finishing up on Crisis Three, it's uh, you know we'll start moving into discussing what uh, what could possibly be next. Yeah. So let's get back to the present. Yeah. Um, you don't have enough time for for the next questions. I think you just uh, something like that. Yeah, I should probably. <laughs> yeah. We should probably wrap should it up. Probably move on with yeah, the event. Yeah. Ähm, und äh, wir äh, sind noch eine Weile hier unterwegs und schauen noch, was wir noch so machen können, was wir noch rausfinden können. Äh, ich bedanke mich auf jeden Fall für das Interview. It was, it was very nice. Great. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you. Ähm, und äh, bis demnächst. Okay.